On behalf of Brinks, Hofer, Gilson, and Leon, hello and welcome to today's virtual panel discussion entitled Green Tech Intellectual Property, Strategies and Opportunities for Your Business. I am pleased to be joined by today's presenter, Kelly K. Burris. Kelly Burris is a shareholder, the chair of Brinks Green Technology Practice Group, and will be the managing partner of Brink's newest office co-located in the new Elijah J. McCoy USPTO building in Detroit. Ms. Burr's practice focuses on the preparation and prosecution of U.S. and foreign patent applications in the mechanical, material science, and electrical arts. Ms. Burris is the recipient of the 2010 Women in Law Award by Michigan Lawyers Weekly, and her recent presentations include the telebriefing entitled Green Tech Patents After the AIA for Law Seminars International in June 2012. We believe today's discussion will provide you with practical guidance on how to best employ legal strategies to increase the value of green technology in your business. This virtual panel offers one hour of CLE credit in Illinois. We are happy to apply for CLE in other states at your request. Please note the window below the video that states CLE tracking. There will be random check-in points during the discussion where you will be asked to enter basic information into the window provided to prove your attendance. After today's program, your certificate of attendance will be sent within 10 business days. We welcome your questions. Submit questions throughout the program via the chat window on the right-hand side of the screen. Our panelist biography and today's presentation can be found in the links at the top of the screen. Click there to download them at any time during the program. And now, today's presentation, Green Tech Intellectual Property, Strategies and Opportunities for Your Business. Hello everyone and welcome to today, today's program on uh, green technology IP. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is take a look at some things that are happening in the uh, green technology industries uh, alongside some uh, legal developments, um, primarily on the patent side, and kind of compare those um, two areas to come up with some uh, business strategies and opportunities for you and your green tech business, whatever type of green tech business you might be involved in. Today's agenda, uh, what we'll do uh, first is we'll do, we'll go through a little background, a little bit of history of green tech. Um, I'll talk about some industry um, trends, industry changes that are impacting us in our IP work right now. Uh, we're going to talk about green technology patent landscapes. Um, I firmly believe that it's very difficult to develop a good business strategy uh, and to leverage your technology without knowing the landscape, without knowing who's out there, who's doing what, what the trends are. There are a number of sources for these landscapes. We've developed one internally, several externally. We'll walk through those. And then with that as a backdrop, I'm going to walk you through a, a conceptual model of a green tech um, space. And we'll look at, depending on where you exist in that green technology space, you may want to employ certain strategies. So we'll talk about those. And then we'll wrap it up with a, um, with a summary of some of the key points. So by way of background, if you look at green technology, it's obviously, it's huge. Green technology is a number of industries. It's wind, it's solar, it's water, it's biofuels, supported by a number of underlying technologies. You've got mechanical, electrical, chemical, um, you know, biofuels, and material science, and green technology is huge. And there are a number of definitions out there for green tech. And the one that I really liked a lot that really struck uh, a chord with me um, was developed by uh, an author, Eric Lane. I don't know if anyone's uh, seen or um, had a chance to take a look at this book. Uh, it's, I think, the pretty much the only book that's out there. It's um, Clean Tech Intellectual Property by Eric Lane. I know Eric did not pay me to do this, but it is a very good book. Eric also has a blog. It's a uh, green patent blog. I've got a link to that at the end of the materials as well. Um, and a few of the concepts that I'll cover today have come from, uh, from this book um, with Eric, who's done a, a very good job as the uh, you know, guru on green tech IP or clean tech IP. And, and what Eric, the way Eric puts it is, um, you know, we are, you know, it's, yes, very diverse technologies involved in green tech, but we're all striving uh, towards the same common goal, the same uh, common purpose, and that's to provide environmental benefits through um, um, climate or, or to mitigate um, 
climate change through renewable resources, improving energy efficiency, and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you know, kind of like a football team, right? You've got the quarterback, you've got the running back, you've got linebackers, tight ends, you know, the wide, the, the wide receivers. You know, they're all very talented in their specific skill set, but they're all working towards that same goal, getting that football into the end zone. So a very analogous, huge area of, t of green tech, and we're just going to chip uh, some of the surfaces today. So by way of background, you know, we all know green tech, clean tech um, is been, has been very hot. It's, it's a hot topic of conversation. Most of the um, firms have green tech or clean tech pra practice groups, a lot of seminars throughout the year. If you look at um, the growth of green technology or clean technology, um, what we've seen is double digit growth over the last 10 years. And that, the data that you're seeing here on this slide is coming from Clean Edge, the US analyst firm Clean Edge. It's a really good source of information if any, anyone wants to go check them out. Um, so you're seeing uh, pretty large substantial growth here in green tech. And also I make reference to the uh, LOHAS consumers, that's Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. And there's an organization if you want to uh, click on that, LOHAS.com. 83% of the consumers in our economy are LOHAS consumers, and it's an almost $300 billion industry. So, you know, green tech is a, a large industry. It's, it's, um, it's been big. Um, and so um, what we're going to do is talk about some of the trends and how it's, how it's impacting us. So given that uh, background and that history of green tech, um, I'm not sure about the audience and other folks who are involved in the green tech uh, area, but it seems like things have been really quiet for the last six to eight months. So, you know, with this big $300 billion industry, double digit growth, why are things so slow? Well, one reason might be the low cost of natural gas, for example. Um, I think we've all heard in the news um, talk about hydraulic fracturing, fracking. I know some states have issued moratoriums on this type of uh, an operation because they're not sure of the environmental impacts. But basically, you're taking water pressure along with some uh, chemicals, and you're introducing those into the ground to create fractures into the layers of the earth that have the gas, and you're bringing up, um, you're bringing up natural gas. And it's a very inexpensive way to get gas, and that's one reason why natural gas prices are so low. With natural gas prices being so low, the demand for alternative forms of energy, for example, biogas, some of these um, you know, anaerobic digesters that create biogas, the demand is, is not there. It's, fa it's faded a little bit from what we've been uh, seeing. So I think that's one big contributor to why things have uh, slowed down a bit. Um, another item that's uh, in the news, um, A123 battery systems. They were big news not too long ago. Um, have fi they filed for bankruptcy October 11th of this year. Uh, big surprise. Um, and I, if you've been following it, it's been going back and forth. Johnson Controls put in a bid, and the Chinese companies put in a bid. Um, they pulled it out, and it's now going to auction, I think, this month in December. Um, and basically what you saw here was the, the investment that was made into, the, uh, into that battery company and many other companies just outpaced the demand for those batteries. Um, I, I saw a statistic that um, you know, when Obama took office, there was this goal of having one million electric vehicles on the road by 2015. And I was shocked to see that number, that as of September 30th, uh, there were only 50,000 electric vehicles on the road. So, so you could say that some of these things are contributing to the slowdown in green tech, but that's not all bad because with that slowdown, there are some things that you can do to um, take advantage of the slowdown to um, try to expand or um, uh, um, have uh, longer IP protection for your assets. And we'll talk about um, some, of those, some of those strategies. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think it's really important that um, in order for you to have a good business strategy with your green tech technology, whatever that technology might be, you have to understand the landscape. Um, you have to understand, uh, you know, is it a growing area? Who are your competitors? Where are they patenting? Is it in the U.S.? Is it China? Is it Japan? Um, you have to really understand the landscape to know, uh, you know, where should I, where do I get to play in that landscape? What do I need to watch out for? Where are the landmines? Where are the opportunities? So um, what we've done is we did a little study earlier this year um, on, worldwide, on a worldwide basis, not just United States, and we've um, developed a... Um, uh, green tech IP landscape that we'd be happy to email to anybody who's listening today. Just you know, follow it up with an email if you'd like that. And these are the buckets that we've set our green technology segments into. We've got vehicles, solar, wind, nuclear, 
pr pretty common little buckets of, uh, of green tech. Um, we, there's also some overlap with these um, segments into the, um, intellect, um, the international patent classification system at the World Intellectual Property Organization. There's a link at the bottom of the slide there. So with that, um, as the buckets that we put our IP or our green tech IP into, um, I know this may be a little bit difficult to see, um, but you know, it, and there's more in the report. But what I want to show is that there's not this huge, you know, um, uh, exponential growth in IP. I think in the U.S. you're seeing that there's quite a bit of growth, but you know, there's growth, but it's slow growth worldwide. And surprisingly, that top bar that you see in terms of these are the number of worldwide patent publications, published applications, issued patents all around the world. That top bar there is uh, nuclear. That's nuclear technology up there. Um, and again, you can dig deeper in these reports. We'll send you a copy and show you who's, who's doing that work. Solar, for example, in the U.S. is just taking off from a, a Chinese company, from SunTech. Um, but you have to know what's on that landscape in order for you to develop your, um, your, um, your strategies. Other green tech uh, patent data that's out there that's available uh, is the uh, Patent Edge database. I've got a link to it there. Um, I think they also provide some services that they can do some mapping for you. Um, and there's also a quarterly report that's put out by um, a law firm. Hold on, I'll get to you in a second. Um, it's, and actually, it shows quite a bit of growth in the U.S., as you can see from that, um, from that chart there. Um, and that, but that's U.S. only. Those are U.S. patents. And that's the um, Heslin Rothenberg firm. And that comes out, on, again, on a quarterly basis. And we're seeing quite a bit of growth in the U.S. But one thing to note, though, those are issued patents, right? So those patents that are issued and that growth that you see is, um, you know, those, are, those patents were filed, uh, the patent applications were filed three or four years ago. So it would be inter it's going to be interesting to see, you know, based on applications filed 2012, 2013, what that growth looks like three, four years from now once those patents start to issue because of the pendency at the USPTO. So again, really important to know um, to lands the landscape in order for you to develop your um, your strategy. Now here here comes my infamous graphic that you know my colleagues give me a hard time about, but until they come up with something better, this is my model. This is my conceptual model for the space of green technology. So um, what, what I say here is that you've got, you're either a core supplier of green technology. So green tech is your business. You're a Vestas wind supplier. You're a SunTech solar panel. You're an ICM doing ethanol. You know, you're one of these, the green tech is your business. So, um, so that's one segment of the space. Another space is you're a supplier to that business. Uh, you like, for example, heaters for solar panel manufacturing. You supply heaters to make those solar panels, but you may also provide heaters to another industry, like injection molding equipment or some other industrial process. So that's why you see those prongs coming off of the little supplier um, graphic there. And then, then, then we've got the advocates, right? The, the companies that aren't necessarily producing, uh, you know, green tech products or products that support green tech, but they are, you know, um, working in a LEED certified building. They're um, practicing uh, good recycling. So you've got these advocates out there as well. And another one of the key points of that graphic is um, that, yeah, I guess it does look like a cloud of dust. <laughs> so it totally look like a cloud of dust, but again, we'll, we'll keep working on that graphic. Um, but there are multiple points of entry into the green tech space, so a lot of opportunities in green tech as well. So here, just reiterating some of the definitions. So you're, uh, you're either, it's either you're a core business or um, you're a supplier or an advocate. And it can be a combination of these three, three things as well. Um, let me see my graphic again. <laughs> so depending on where you exist in that space, um, your business strategy is going to change. And again, it could be a combination of one of the above, so you can employ more than one strategy, but my point is, depending on who you are and what you're doing, your strategy is gonna be different. It's very similar to the um, Edison in the Boardroom book, where there's a value hierarchy, and you, you exist at each level in that hierarchy depending on what your business goals are. So uh, a similar analog with my, um, I'm gonna call it my brainy icon. My brainy icon. So, so let's get into some some legal changes that have, have that have come up as of late, and how that impacts green tech. It impacts everybody, but what specifically in green tech gets impacted by the America Invents Act, for example, patent reform signed into law uh, uh, September 16th of 2011. Um, the first big uh, provision that's coming into play next year. I hope everybody's got this on their radar, and if it's not, it should be. It is the biggest change that came with patent reform, which changes the U.S. from a first to invent country to a first inventor to file 
country. So it's going to become more of a race to the patent office. So um, some strategy, like for green tech companies, you're seeing a lot of technology development. Things are happening at a very rapid pace. So as this date approaches, you need to be thinking about what, am I, what do I do differently to take advantage of or to make sure that I'm not losing out with this, this deadline looming, not deadline, but this enactment date um, coming up here pretty quick. So one of the things that green tech companies are going to want to do is file um, uh, provisional patent applications, multiple provisional patent applications. Um, for those of you who aren't patent attorneys, uh, those of you who are, I apologize, <laughs> this is a little remedial, um, but you can file a provisional patent application at the United States Patent and Trademark Office and have up to one year to decide whether you want to proceed with a standard non-provisional uh, patent application. So you can get your foot in the door, you get your filing date, you beat somebody else to the punch, and you can put more than one invention into a provisional patent application as well. It can be 14, 17, 21 different inventions can go all in one, what we call omnibus uh, provisional patent application. There are certain ways that you want to strategize filing those, but you can put them all in just to get that date. I'm the first one to the patent office. Um, another thing you might want to consider as well, since you know, if you're in an area where there's a lot of technology development, let's say it's you know March 10th or um, maybe even you know March 11th, good date, somebody's birthday. Um, all birthday presents can be sent to <laughs> the email address that you have there. So. <laughs> So anyway, so, the, so March 16th comes closer, right? And you, you got this invention, you got all these, you know, 20 inventions. What do I do? Do I, do I file on March 16th? Do I file? Well, one thing that we've uh, talked about with our clients is file a provisional on March 15th and you file a provisional on March 16th. And then what you do is you see how the facts play out and then you decide, okay, I'm going to let one go or let the other one go and use the law that's going to benefit me the most. The law, the first to invent law, sets of laws, or uh, the first to file set of laws. So you, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about filing um, on one day, you know, file March 15th and then file again on March 16th and just see how things play out. So that's another strategy that you can employ as well. Um, we've also talked about when you file uh, your provisional patent application doing a simultaneous or a parallel public disclosure of your invention. Um, and what that buys you is it gets it out into, the, you have your patent application filed, it gets out in the public domain, and then one year later if you decide not to go forward with your non-provisional application, um, you know, that does not get public, your provisional does not get published, so nobody knows about it, right? So a year later you decide not to file, and then a competitor or another third party uh, files a patent application on the same invention, and guess what, you, you know, you're out of luck. But if you simultaneously um, have a public disclosure, that's going to prevent somebody else from uh, obtaining patent protection if you, if, you, if you disclose that information. So uh, a simultaneous parallel disclosure is a good idea there as well uh, with the first inventor to file. Um, I think that was it on that one. Um, the, another change that came into play with the American Vents Act was best mode, and that came into uh, effect as of the signing date. Um, back in September of 2011, and what that provision says is that um, under the let me back up under the patent laws, you're obligated to disclose your best mode of operating the invention to the patent office, and uh, the best materials, you know, process uh, settings, um, you know, the, the angle of the blade on your airfoil, whatnot. You have you're obligated under Section 112 of Title 35 to disclose the best mode. What changed in the law was. Um, if that patent is litigated and it's determined that you failed to disclose your best mode to the patent office, failure to disclose best mode is no longer grounds to invalidate a patent. So a lot of people thought, well, we'll just we won't disclose the best mode. We'll keep some of that information close to our chest. Um, I, we worked with a client that had German investors. And in Germany, they don't have this requirement. And the German investors didn't want them to disclose certain information. They wanted to kind of keep you know, manufacturing tolerances, some material combinations. They wanted to keep certain information out of the patent application. But you know, I, would, I would warn against uh, keeping that information out because there's still an affirmative obligation to disclose that information under 112. And uh, let's say it's uh, determined that you, they find out that you didn't disclose best mode, it may cut off your ability to get injunctive relief. Um, so it, there's some, some issues there. And also, if you're a patent practitioner and you um, knowingly um, participated in this activity to not disclose the best mode, have you committed a fraud on the patent office? Um, have you, um, have you, did you not follow your obligations, your duty as a patent attorney? So um, I, guess the, I guess the point I'm making there is, is that just to throw up a warning flag to be careful to um, 
to, to disclose your best mode, otherwise it may have implications other than you know, the failure to um, say the patent's invalid. Okay, so prior commercial use, um, that was a, a um, part of the American Vents Act that came into play as of the signing. Um, as we'll see on some of the next slides I have, um, with a lot of the green technologies, um, what you're seeing is a lot of old processes uh, applied to new technology, new applications. Um, for example, some of the solar panels, some of the wind uh, turbines. The, the, so the processes are there, um, but the applications not, and they're having a hard time making their way through the patent office. Well, under the prior commercial use defense under AIA, as long as your um, use of, like, let's say, that ma a manufacturing process was in commercial use in the United States for more than one year before the effective filing date of that third-party uh, patentee, you're not on the hook for patent infringement. And there are other requirements uh, there as well. But in a nutshell, what that allows you to do is to keep that information as a trade secret and reduce the risk of having a third party come after you later for patent infringement. It doesn't invalidate their patent. They still can go after other third parties, but you're off the hook. So keep in mind that if there are certain processes you're using in the green tech world that you think you may have a hard time getting them through the patent office and, and they are subject matter that qualifies for trade secret, you may want to keep them close to the chest because you can take advantage of this commercial use defense. Uh, prioritized examination. I think we all know that the green tech uh, pilot program that was at the patent office has now expired. There are ways to get your patent application through the patent office quicker. I'll talk about a couple of those later, but under the AIA, uh, you can pay a fee if you're a large entity of $4,800, um, and they will um, place your application towards the top of the stack and the, with the goal towards getting your application through in one year. Uh, there's certain information that has to go along with that filing. Um, you know, you do your own prior art search, um, and you um, basically are um, telling the, the examiner why your claims are patentable right off the bat versus vice versa, which is not always a good thing because you may make an admission against your own interest. Um, but there is that tool available under the America Invents Act uh, for a little bit of extra filing fees. Um, and then contesting patentability. There are t uh, some new procedures that were um, put into place under the American Invents Act. Um, on patents that will issue after that, um, that are filed on or after that March 16th date, there will be a post-grant review uh, proceeding available. And within nine months of that patent issuing, you can go back to the patent office and challenge that patent. It's very similar to the European opposition proceedings. Um, and com as compared to litigation, much, le much less expensive and um, a quicker resolution, and it is appealable to the federal circuit. So those post-grant review proceedings are available, and also inter partes um, review in front of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, and those are conducted uh, after that nine-month period and have certain limitations on what qualifies as uh, prior art to challenge a, a patent. But those two new proceedings uh, will be coming into play with the American Vents Act. So, you know, in this uh, rapidly evolving green tech area, if you're seeing these patents come out, uh, you've got nine months as, uh, if, if they're filed on or after that date to go challenge them back at the patent office without getting into heavy duty, very costly um, federal uh, litigation. Okay, so. Um, with that in mind, and with that business model in mind, one of the things that comes up for the core businesses, um, as I mentioned, there's a, with green tech that you've seen a lot more uh, focus on manufacturing processes, um, a new use, for example, of a known process, um, and, you, and you're winding up getting these rejections at the patent office that your invention is obvious. Um, for those of you that are patent attorneys know this, but one of the requirements for patentability is that your invention has to be non-obvious to one skilled in the art. So someone who's an expert in the field or knows the art um, would look at your invention and go, oh, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that, it's pretty cool. Or yeah, that's obvious, I would have, if you put those components together in that fashion, of course that would be the outcome and this is obvious and it's really nothing um, that, that should be entitled to patent protection. So we're seeing a lot of these 103 rejections at the patent office. Um, one example that I just got from Eric Lane's book, which I think is a really good example, um, this is the Swift Wind uh, Turbine. And it was rejected twice at the patent office under um, the 103 standard, the non-obvious standard. You've got, um, basically what happened was the examiner found the components of that rotor that you see in the center there, the blades, the airfoils, um, and then a diffuser ring in the prior art and, and in one single reference. And then he found 
an airfoil diffuser that you see on the back end there. It looks like a boom almost. He found that feature in a different prior art reference and said it would have been obvious to combine these two things to come up with this wind turbine that Swift had. And so what, what I found really interesting about this case was that Swift went to the patent office with audiovisual um, information. They, they said it's, that the, the degree of noise reduction that they achieved with this wind turbine which was much lower than what they expected. So they had what's called unexpected results. Uh, you know, one of the ways that you can overcome a 103 rejection, uh, we call these secondary considerations. You can show that there's a great, you've had great commercial success, there were unexpected results, there was this, this need and it was uh, no one's what, in the art, in the market, and you know it's been going on a long time and no one's been able to, to crack this nut. Um, and I think oftentimes as practitioners, we um, don't pay enough attention to these secondary considerations. And here's a really creative use of the secondary considerations to say, well, we didn't expect this amount of noise reduction. They went to the patent office and they played, a, they played an audio tape of, listen to how quiet this is. Listen to some, some wind turbines in the prior art, and now listen to ours. Listen to how quiet it was, and, and voila, uh, the patent issued. So. Um, so I encourage you to think about some of those secondary considerations, especially in the green tech area. And if, for example, you're having great commercial success compared to um, what others have tried in, in the past. Um, another strategy, again, this is uh, from Eric's book, but I think it's a pretty common strategy that we use as patent attorneys, is to take a um, kind of a macro micro look at uh, what you've got in your um, uh, in your invention. For example, here you've got a um, gasification facility. It's an entire facility and you could just patent that entire uh, gasification system, but you know there's there are components of that gasification system as well. There's you know solid waste handling, there's plastics handling, there's um, you know there's reconditioning of the gas, there's um, there are different control systems that you use to, to control the flow throughout the entire system. So there are individual components of that overall invention. Uh, that overall system that are patentable as well. So what you want to do is, uh, you know, patent those individual components and the overall system as well. Because, you know, what if someone who's making a, um, you know, wind turbine wants to use your control algorithms or your control system for their wind turbine, but that's not your business. Your business is gasification. So you might be able to license some of that technology or license that patent into a field of use for uh, that, that third party that's not really your competitor. So, um, so we call this layered protection. You want to get the overall system, individual subsystems. We also take a look at consumables as well. It's not really shown on here, but if there are some materials that are being handled throughout this system, that's a consumable material that your, um, your customer is buying from you. It's, it's always um, a good idea to see if you can try to get a patent on those consumables, the material composition itself. Um, basically, any ingredient that goes into your overall system, you want to try to see uh, what type of patent protection you can get on it um, to help leverage, you know, your um, your right to exclude and also to possibly sub-license uh, or license out to um, an industry that you're not in. Okay, so we talked a little bit about accelerating uh, patents. The green tech uh, pilot program at the at the patent office has been um, terminated. But, you know, it is still available in other countries around the world. It's still available in Canada, Australia, Japan, Israel, Korea, and the UK. Uh, I believe Brazil has some, um, some provisions as well. Um, but the, the point here is the U.S. and along with the countries I've listed here are members of the Patent Prosecution Highway. And basically with, under that program, if you get the claims allowed in the original application that you filed, you can file a petition with these other patent offices that are members of Patent Prosecution Highway, provided they haven't started examining your patent application yet. You can file a petition and say, hey, you know, I got my U.S. patent. Let's now grant it in, um, in Korea and Japan. And the patent does issue very quickly. We had a case in Japan that we got a notice of allowance within two weeks after we sent them the, issue, the allowed claims in the U.S. So the idea here is, to the extent you have facilities overseas, you have operations in these countries, can you file for patent protection first in Canada uh, and then get your notice of allowance and then come back uh, into the United States to get your patent faster? But, you know, keep in mind that, you know, uh, getting a fast patent isn't always getting a good patent either. So, um, you know, some industries you may want it quicker, some may not, you may not, um, but just, you know, that's a tool that you can use in your business to expedite if you need. Um, 
I talked a little bit earlier about um, the whole natural gas prices being low and, for example, the biogas equipment manufacturers going, well, you know, I've got this great equipment, I've got this patent application pending, um, but there's no market for it, there's no demand for it. Um, we have a case where the claims have been rejected twice, and now, the, now what do we do with this patent application? Well, now I can file an appeal at the patent office and basically buy myself some time for the client because as soon as I file, in order to file a notice of appeal, uh, or an appeal, a request for appeal at the patent office, your claims have to have been rejected uh, twice. Um, and then once you file that notice of appeal, the 20 year time clock that's ticking during the pendency of your patent application, it stops. So the, the, the pendency while you're waiting there for that appeal hearing, uh, that it's over two years right now, although it is, has been coming down over recent years, um, you know, that you can add two years basically to your 20 year time, ter time uh, uh, your, your term on your patent. So, um, you know, that's a strategy you could think about instead of, you know, continuing to do battle with the examiner. Maybe I file, if it's ready for appeal, you have to make sure it's ready for appeal. If it's ready for appeal, I file appeal and I hang out two or three years and maybe natural gas prices have gone back up by then. And then your 20 year patent term gets adjusted. So, you know, there's a way to slow down your patents if you want to slow down your patents versus speeding them up through accelerated prosecution. Um, and then I talked a little bit about licensing. You know, I, I think that um, this kind of goes without saying you can license in or you can license out your technology. Um, when I talked about that gasifis gasification facility, that's a really good example of how you can break out your invention into individual components and then license those out into what we call fields of use. So it might be, you know, I'm going to allow the wind turbine guys to use this, but I'm not going to allow the biogas guys to use this. So that's a way to get some of your... Um, you know, some licensing revenue in the door. Um, and, then, uh, so, and then if there's a component to your process that you need, instead of, you know, paying attention um, or looking to your competitors for that technology, maybe there's an, there's that, an analogous technology in another field that you can go out and get as you, uh, as you study this landscape. I mean, we've studied landscapes and seen patents that are owned by individuals. And I think we had a guy in Greece that had a patent and we bought it for $10,000 and it was of high value to the company. So you, there, there are assets out there that are, that are to be had. It's not every case, of course, but um, you really have to know that landscape to know what you can do and can't do in terms of licensing in or out. And then the point of having you know, um, partnerships in local markets. If there is a manufacturer in an area that's got, you know, that knows how to do it, maybe you want to set up a strategic partnership with that uh, company to get into that market, into that geographic market, for example. So there are some things that you can do there as well. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, getting into the trademark area, um, you know, green branding. We've heard a lot about green washing. Um, you know, with the increase or with the uh, development of green technology comes people trying comes uh, companies trying to brand themselves as green tech companies. Um, but there's a little bit of a tension there between what makes, for example, a good trademark and what, what you're trying to convey to your consumers or to your, to your customers. Um, in order to have a good trademark, that mark, you want it to be um, very arbitrary, very fanciful, not to have any meaning. Uh, examples of some really good uh, trademarks are you know, like Kodak, for example, or Polaroid. They don't mean anything. They're very arbitrary. But when you get into marks, for example, um, these are, again, examples from Eric's book, the green key, that was a, you know, a green, it was a key made out of bio, uh, recyclable materials that it was actually a key that you used to open a, a door, like, for example, in a hotel. And they called it green key because it was made out of recyclable material. And the examiner at the patent office said, well, that's descriptive of your goods. Um, and so those aren't necessarily um, good marks to have. A descriptive mark is registrable at the patent office, but what you have to do is you have to go out and you have to show what's called secondary meaning, that you've acquired this distinctiveness through the consumer seeing that green key mark and going, yes, I know that's your company. That's the company that provides these recyclable keys. So you have to make that association between the consumers and your, and your actual um, the brand, the trademark that you're trying to use, and that's, um, you can acquire distinctiveness that way to register your mark. But just keep in mind that the more you want to call something green and the more it's descriptive, so you're going to run into challenges at the patent office with these, um, with these terms, and green works as well. And then, of course, there are certification marks that you can use provided you meet the criteria to become, for example, an Energy Star appliance or a LEED certified building, depending on the number of points that you have 
in your building you can be lead silver gold or platinum but there are certification marks that are available uh, for you to use as well in your green technology business um, and then in terms of the greenwashing I mentioned a bit ago, um, there are some guides. Um, the, the Federal Trade Commission has guides on how, what you can and can't say in terms of how um, you know, green your technology is or how green your products or services are. I've got a link there to those green guides. And then there's an organization, uh, Terra Choice, they have these seven sins of greenwashing, which is really interesting to go out and look at, especially their, their little uh, uh, cartoon characters they have on their website. That might be where I got that graphic for my model of the green tech space, actually. No, I'm kidding. Um, so these territories, they've got, I mean, they go just about every product they go look at, there's one sin, you know, it's, uh, you know, over promoting the efficiency that this um, particular product uh, provides or whatnot. Um, and the causes of action here, we usually see false advertising, breach of warranty, unjust enrichment, and they're typically class actions. And I don't know if anyone's seen recently, there was a class action lawsuit filed against the Nissan Leaf car like to the, the electric car because it's not meeting some of the performance requirement or performance specifications that Nissan's put out. So that was just filed, I believe, in uh, October. Another one I just saw on, um, on Eric's blog was a, a, a couple down in Indiana that bought a wind turbine because it purported to have all these great benefits for their energy production. And in the end, it wound up sucking energy away from them. So they, um, you know, they won that suit not too long ago as well. So you got to be really careful about what performance um, specs you put out on your green tech products because if they don't meet them you can um, fall under the guise of some of these um, causes of action and then of course violate some of the green guides under the FTC uh, system. So just, just be careful about the marks that you use as the message there. Um, there are also um, some uh, sharing kind of um, kind of like co-ops in a way where if you have green technology that you're not using, that you think another company might be able to use, there are these exchanges um, that exist. The Eco Patent Commons is one of them. I've, I've listed uh, the web link there, the URL there. Um, the Green Exchange is another one that was set up by Nike, Best Buy, and some other um, big, larger companies that, you know, they're developing huge patent portfolios, but really not putting these green technologies into their products for one reason or the other. And so they basically donated to them to this green exchange that allows startup companies to go take a look at, well, maybe I could use this patent in my business. And so if you are a startup business, you know, there are these exchanges that you can go to um, to see if you could take advantage of some of the IP that um, these companies aren't using anymore. And then um, there's also there are resources all around the world, but another good place to look for um, uh, patents, especially um, in my observation, it, it just seems like it seems like Europe and some of these other countries are a little bit ahead of us in some of these green tech areas, especially wind. Um, and they've developed a very um, thorough database of patents that are available um, over in Europe. And there's a link to, to that system there. Um, and that is also a good source to use if you're going to do your IP landscape mapping to see, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a really good idea to have that landscape so you know, you know, where you want to play and what you want to take advantage of and the landmines to watch out for. And this is a, the green uh, patent database is a good place to go to, to to see what else is out there if you're planning on being outside of the United States um, in, your, in your green tech business. Okay, so, so in summary, you know, I, um, again, um, being repetitive, but you know, it's really, it's really important to make sure you understand that landscape that you operate in, uh, what your competition is up to, and not just do one sweep of a landscape you know, today and that's it, that's your landscape for the next five years. You have to update this landscape on a you know, probably quarterly, at least biannually basis to kind of keep an eye on who's doing what. So maintain a watch on that IP landscape and know what your competition's up to. Um, and then depending on what type of a green tech company you are, if you're a startup, if you're an established core operator of green tech uh, business or a supplier, um, leverage those different strategies to your advantage, the licensing, for example, the macro micro approach. Um, and then monitor what's happening in the industry. You know, for example, the, the natural gas, you know, the natural gas uh, prices are low and they've been low for a while. And so, 
you know, maybe you want to slow down some of your, um, you know, so maybe some of your, maybe, maybe instead of filing full-blown non-provisional applications, you file a provisional to buy yourself another year before you decide to file or not. You know, that when you file a provisional patent application, that one-year, um, you know, uh, clock that, that ticks is not taken away from your 20-year patent term. So filing provisional applications, applications might be a good idea to kind of slow yourself down. Um, on the trademark side, the branding side, you know, follow those green guides, you know, get some outside counsel to take a look and, you know, give you the, the thumbs up before you start going out and making all these claims. Um, or you could soon find yourself um, distracted uh, with, these, um, with these lawsuits. And then consider not just, you know, as a startup tapping into these green commons or exchanges, but as a, you know, as a core supplier, you know, if you have a bit, uh, patents that you're not using, consider contributing them to these green commons and exchanges, and hopefully someone else can use them, and, you know, back, you know, you might get a, a, a small royalty back from them. And so that concludes the materials for our program. Uh, in the package, again, I have a link to uh, Eric Lane's book, um, if you're interested, and also a link to his blog, and he sends out daily updates. It's a great resource for anyone who's uh, working in the green tech space or wanting to work in the green tech space. And uh, thank you for your um, attendance today. And so now we'll uh, turn to our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in to us um, and we'll answer them uh, as we have enough time. So looks like we have a few here. Okay, so you've talked a lot about utility patents and trademarks. But you haven't talked about design patents. Can you let us? Can you talk about how design patents have impacted the green technology IP landscape? Um, sure. Yeah, that's a great point. It's probably some uh, materials that we want to add to our presentation. Design patents are uh, one of three types of patents that exist at the USPTO. There's the utility patents that we're used to, how something works, the material it's made out of. There are plant patents that protect asexually reproduced plants, and there are design patents which basically cover um, the ornamental appearance or uh, an article of manufacturing, what it looks like. You know, there may be a design patent on the shape of this remote control or a um, design patent on the shape of my watch face. So a design patent just protects what something looks like. So in the green technology area, that could be any number of things. You know, for example, that, um, that swift wind turbine, what that wind turbine looks like could be protected by a design patent. Now, design patents do not cover any of the functional aspects of your product or of that article of manufacture, and they can't be primarily functional in nature. However, that's a very loose standard. So, um, so you could file a design patent on that wind turbine or in a blade of a wind turbine, or um, for example, um, your anaerobic digester, um, you know, the way that the housing might be shaped to take, you know, certain materials in, um, maybe a solar panel, maybe a solar array. You're, there's a certain, uh, this is actually a really good example, um, there's a certain array of solar panels, the, the, the outline of the actual grid itself, you, you can um, protect what that looks like. So no one else can make a solar panel that looks like your solar panels, provided it meets the requirements of patentability. You know that it's um, that it's new, that no one's ever done it before, and it's non-obvious to one skilled in the art. And so um, design patents are they differ in a number of ways. Um, they have a 14-year term, which is 14 years from the date that they actually issue. Uh, there are no maintenance fees on design patents. So once you file your design patent application, it's allowed, you pay your issue fee, you're done. It, it, you don't have to pay those maintenance fees every you know, three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years after the patent issues, or in foreign countries, you know, every, every year. Um, and you can have foreign counterparts to your design patent as well. Um, the foreign filing deadline on designs is, um, is six months um, rather than a year, so you have to really have your head in the game and know when that six months is, is, is coming up. And they're, they're relatively inexpensive to file. Uh, for design patent applications. You're talking, you know, the in a design patent application, the most expensive thing uh, are the drawings. And the specification, what you describe in a design patent application is, you know, what is claimed is what's shown in the drawings. And that's pretty much it. There are some um, uh, strategies to employ when you file those applications in terms of what you claim and what you don't claim. I mean, because you can use broken lines to show environmental structure. You can show um, like an indeterminate length if you have a certain look and feel to your solar panel, um, but you have a very large panel and you have a very small panel, you can file in your application kind of an indeterminate length that it looks like 
this, but it could be 10 feet long or it could be a foot, a foot long. So there are some strategies you can employ to get broader protection in your design patent application as well. Um, and so design patent applications go through very, very quick very quickly through the patent office. So they're relatively inexpensive. They go through very fast, um, no maintenance fees. But you know, on the other hand, you, know, you have to, you know, design patents are only what the um, article of manufacture looks like. And with that, um, it's, um, you know, you could argue that it's relatively easy to design around that design patent. You know, if I want to do, if I, if I see my competitors claiming this round panel, I just make a square panel. I mean, it's a very simple example, but it's, they're much easier to design around than our utility patents. So um, design patents are just definitely ought to be part of your, part of your green tech game. Okay, so here we have a question. Uh, given the state of green tech today, uh, is it wise to consider starting up a green tech company? It's my lawyer answer. It depends, right? <laughs> it, it, it really depends on the industry you want to get. You're wanting to get into, um, you know, the business case that you have. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, even with the slowdown of green tech, there still still are a lot of investors out there. There's a lot of need for green tech. Um, we've put a lot of resources into developing the technology, and the demand will catch up with that. It's uh, you know, so so the person who's wanting to know should you start up a green tech company. It depends on what area you're in. You know, know that landscape. Where's a good entry point, um, and know that things will pick up. Okay. And as a reminder to everyone who's listening or on uh, on the V panel, um, please send your questions in. I'm happy to uh, to try to address them. Uh, one of the questions that came in um, it was around patent filing strategies. Uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit with the. Um, uh, the March 16th date of 2013 looming, you know, that's just a few short months away. And those of you who are patent filers need to be thinking about your, your timing on when you file these patent applications, uh, filing before, as I mentioned, to take advantage of the old laws uh, under first to invent or filing on or after that March 16th date to, um, to, be, to take advantage of laws under first to file. Um, again, I think that these provisional patent applications are, uh, are a really good idea so that you can, um, you know, kind of test the waters before you go forward with uh, your invention. You, you can put, again, multiple inventions into the same provisional application, or you can break them out into separate applications as well because they, um, you know, they're not, the filing fees on a provisional patent application are, are um, relatively low. You know, one of the things to, to keep in mind on the provisional as well, when you file a U.S. Uh, patent application, you have one year from that filing date to file your foreign patent applications, whether it be through um, a patent cooperation treaty filing, a PCT filing, we call it, or in foreign countries. So even though you have a year from that provisional filing, um, to decide what you want to do with those inventions, um, whether you want to file in the U.S. non-provisional non -provisional or not, that one-year foreign filing deadline applies back to your provisional date. So be thinking about as that one year from the provisional filing gets closer, what do I want to do in foreign countries? Um, because that, if you want to take advantage of that earlier filing date of your provisional, um, you're, you're going to have to file from one year from that date as well. So that's uh, you know something to think about on uh, more of the the, the con side. Um, you know, and again, depending on the technology you're involved in, you may want to speed things up. You may want to slow things down. Um, speeding things up, accelerated prosecution. You know, there are um, a number of ways that you can try to get your applications through uh, quicker. Um, you can file uh, fewer claims, very narrow claims. Uh, for example, relative to the prior art, and get that patent through. And before the patent issues, you can file a continuation patent application with um, maybe broader claims so that you have another patent application in the mill while, while the one application has issued now into a patent and you have that resource. And you can kind of keep that door open as long as you have an application pending um, to try for broader and broader claims as time goes on. And that's a strategy that's used not just in green tech, but in a lot of different industries as well. So there's that possibility to stretch things out um, if you have the resources to file multiple applications as well. And we have a question. In my opinion, is shale really the future of energy? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, shale gas or fracking is one way to get a um, an energy source. I, I don't 
personally, I don't think it's the future of energy. I think it's one ingredient in a um, you know, recipe of uh, energies that we will need um, to move forward. But I don't think that it is the future of energy. Okay, so here we have a question. Um, can you, I'm gonna move this closer so I'm not jacking my neck over there. Um, can you go into uh, special challenges with biofuels and their patents? And is there any company like SunTech in the biofuel industry? Um, yeah, one of the, the challenges um, that you see with biofuels is that, um, you know, the, the, the chemical processes that are used in biofuels, the chemical reactions that occur, the, um, the ways in which you recycle certain components and extract, um, for example, you know, um, wet distillers grains, you know, those individual um, uh, processes or methods in and of themselves have been used in other processes, but maybe not combined into one overall system. So the, uh, one of the issues that you see, or one of the challenges that you see with biofuels is that 103 rejection that I mentioned a little bit earlier, that an examiner is going to find individual components of your, um, of your biofuel system, and they're gonna reject your claim as being obvious. So, um, and, I, and I've had these personally, a lot of 103 rejections, and that's where we have to go in with, um, uh, typically, you know, the best way to get, I think we as patent practitioners know the best way to get these applications through is to go sit down with the examiner and go through your claims, go through the prior art. Oftentimes you take the inventor with you. We've taken inventors with us with a jar of uh, thin stillage and showing them how it's different than what's in the prior art. Um, and so that kind of gets into those secondary considerations. Like this is the stillage that we came up with that we didn't, you know, we didn't expect this to happen in the overall system with all these reactions. Um, so the challenges that you face getting these applications through are, are often overcome by, you know, going to see the examiner, sitting down in front of them and talking about the claims and setting up these interviews. And um, so that's, that's one way to overcome it. Um, but again, the challenge, the biggest challenge I see is the, um, that there's, there's a lot of prior art and the 103 challenges are hard to overcome. Um, is there a company like SunTech in the biofuel industry? Um, if this question is directed to a Chinese, if there's a Chinese company in the biofuel industry, um, I would have to go, whoever sent this in, let me know and I'll send you the report. But the, um, the report for biofuels, most of the activity that we see in biofuels is actually, um, there's quite a bit coming out of Brazil. There's quite a bit coming out of the United States. I'd have to take a closer look at the report to see who, what company that is um, that has that activity. But I don't recall seeing a large amount of activity from a Chinese company uh, in the biofuels area. Okay, so now we have another question. Um, have you seen any recent activity and technology related to converting coal-fired power plants to green fuels? even in light of natural gas prices. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have. We've seen quite a bit of activity um, with taking, uh, you know, what we call biomass. Um, you know, anything that's, you know, corn stover and leaves and, you know, the, the, basically the remnants of what you see out in the farm fields are being um, processed, combined with uh, certain binders, certain ingredients to create a, uh, a fuel source that has the BTUs that are, um, approaching and sometimes even higher than with certain additives than a, you know, a lump of coal. And the cool thing about some of these biomass fuel sources is that they can go into um, the, same, the same coal uh, power plant or the same power plant that was used to burn the coal. So you don't have to build a special plant for these, bio, uh, these biomass um, fuel sources. You can use existing coal fired power plants and just substitute the material, you know, one for one. Um, but there's a lot of um, material science that's involved in, the, in that biomass. And I, I believe there's a, a really nice biomass conference every year. It goes from city to city. I believe it was in, might have been in Denver last year. Um, an entire week dedicated to, you know, biomass 
um, compositions and binders and processing, processing equipment, how you get it into that shape form that you need. What is the shape form that you need? What, what is, should it look like? Is it a puck? Is it a pellet? You know, what's going to work best? Um, and then the equipment that's used, the actual um, power burning facilities. So um, big, uh, interesting conferences there on, on biomass. So, um, and also on the biomass topic, you know, a lot of the biomass prior art that we've seen has come from, from Europe. There's a, you know, the more I work in green tech, the more I see that there's a lot, the prior art that's being used to reject the claims here in the U.S. is coming from Germany, it's coming from the U.K., it's coming from the European Patent Office, and there are technologies that have been employed over there for, for a long, long time. And that's been, you know, the, one of the biggest roadblocks for us in getting our, our um, claims through is the prior art that's coming in from Europe, because they are ahead of us in, the, in a number of areas. So the question came in, you know, why is Europe ahead of uh, the U.S.? And I think that, a, a, you know, a big reason for that is that, you know, fuel prices, fossil fuels have been expensive in Europe for a very long time, and it's been uh, cost prohibitive for them to use the, the fossil fuels um, for their energy needs. And so there's been, you know, a, a demand to, well, you know, drive smaller cars and find alternative uh, fuel sources um, because the prices are so high. And I'm not... Um, uh, up to speed on the government requirements, but I, you know, in terms of recycling, here, take for example anaerobic digesters. Um, you know, I, I think uh, this would be a good, a, a, an interesting uh, exercise for for the Letterman show. If you take some guy off the street and ask him about an anaerobic digester, they're going to, what are you talking about, an anaerobic digester? And the way I look at anaerobic digesters are these big stomachs. You throw, you know, stuff in and it processes way, any kind of waste, you know, restaurant waste, yard waste, and out comes energy, out comes, um, you know, wet distillers, grains, and out comes, um, you know, ethanol. And um, so there are these devices that through chemical processes and certain additives can create energy based on waste, so waste to energy. Um, there are, um, over in Europe, when you drive around, there are anaerobic digesters in people's backyards or in the community backyards. Um, and I don't know to what extent the government requires uh, materials to be recycled or requires the use of these devices or if there are tax uh, breaks for these devices. I'm not an expert on that, but there's, um, there's much, more, much more of a presence of these alternative energy devices in Europe than there are here because of, because of a need. And you know, I think this space is probably a little bit tighter over in Europe as well. Um, you do, but you do read about universities starting to do a lot more research um, with anaerobic digesters. Um, you know, there's a um, there's actually a place right here in Chicago called I think it's called Plant Chicago, and they're trying to it's a vertical farm. They're trying to uh, it's in an old um, building just south of town, and they have a uh, anaerobic digester that was put in by a local company, Eisenman, right down here in Crystal Lake, um, and they're using that anaerobic digester to help them reduce their energy consumption. Um, I've seen research at Michigan State University. They just recently purchased a five or six million dollar anaerobic digester. Um, and I think that, you know, 10 years from now, you're gonna start seeing these devices or these pieces of, almost looks like farming equipment um, in communities, in uh, farm fields to process that waste. If you think about it, there's a lot of waste that comes off of, you know, our uh, farming processes, our manufacturing processes, our, our daily use. And if you can take that material, material and throw it into um, these digesters and create energy out of it, you know, it's a win-win. You know, the land, we don't have to put as much in the landfill and we can get energy out of it. It's just a matter of making a cost-effective device that, um, that will work to process that waste. So waste to energy, I think, is a, um, is a big area that has yet to be tapped into here in the United States. But, you know, we're, we're a um, fossil fuel-hungry country and until something changes, um, we're gonna keep doing the, taking the easy road there. Okay. The question was, how are the larger companies who have these uh, pieces of equipment, how are they surviving with the green tech slowdown? And I think um, that that diversification is the key there, you know, that they have businesses um, um, in other areas that are able to absorb the 
the slowdown in green tech or the dip in, in green tech. So they have a diversified business that are feeding a number of industries. And this is where, you know, being a, in that um, in that space model that I talked about, this is where if you know if, if it's not your core business, if you're a supplier, this is where you're going to survive through the slowdown because you're supplying other industries besides green tech. Um, but it will it will come back. I, it was just a I think that there was a huge number. You know, green tech got hot. Growth was great, and you know it's it's economics. I mean, natural gas is cheaper, so that's what people are using. Um, you know, I'm sure if gas prices went down below three dollars a gallon, we'd all be driving our cars a little bit more as well. So um, I think economics plays into it. But for those larger companies, they're surviving because I think they're diversified. Okay. So here was a question. Um, are there any examples that you can um, cite of startup companies using the green exchange successfully? Um, I don't know of any personally. Um, I would probably go to that website to see of, uh, see of any successes that have, that have come from that green exchange. Um, and Eric may have talked about it in his book as well, but I don't, I don't recall offhand, but I would probably go to that website to, to check that out. Um, and here's another question that's <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, can you go into the challenges of organic agriculture and the patents that are coming up around the industry? Um, you know, organic ag agriculture is um, it's an interesting area. It's um, I, the growth in that area is relatively flat, and it's probably one of the um, the green technologies that are, uh, are uh, kind of on the lower end in terms of the number of publications that we've seen coming out of that area. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't do any work in organic agriculture, so I'm not sure what challenges they're seeing in terms of um, of the patents that they're filing. Um, but I would be happy to if whoever asked this question sent me their email address to follow up on that question. But I'm not that familiar with organic agriculture, except to say that it's a, a relatively low, it's, a, it's an area of very low activity in those green tech buckets that I shared. So that's going to conclude our program for today. Thank you for your attendance at our V panel on uh, green tech IP. This concludes our presentation. Don't forget to download the speaker bio and the presentation before you tune out. We are delighted to answer additional questions afterwards by phone or email. And remember, you must respond to the check-in tracking to get CLE credit. Your certificate of attendance will be sent within 10 business days. Thanks to everyone for joining us.